Since its introduction in Worlds Collide, House Saurian has become a staple of Keyforge, showing up in four sets up to date, including Winds of Exchange. It entered the game at the same time as House Star Alliance, and with Worlds Clyde being the first set to introduce new houses, Fantasy Flight made sure to make these new houses as flashy and fun to play as possible, pushing their dominant mechanics to the max and instantly making them fan favorites. Since then, the developers have fought to correct this, attempting to balance soaring out to a more sensible level, something far less meta-defining and overpowering. However, as we'll see, this course of action may have been taken too far, with sets like Dark Tidings suffering for it. This is the rise and fall of House Saurian, a story of overcorrection. You haven't experienced Worlds Collide until you've gotten to play with or against a halfway decent Saurian pod. The cards Saurian was given in this set are just crazy, and the simple yet powerful synergies they create with each other are absurd, and can be nigh unbeatable without the right counters. Their primary mechanic centered around the new concept of exalting, taking an ember from the common supply and placing it on the creature or creature specified by the card instructing you to exalt something. It was meant to be a risk reward mechanic. Here's a nice benefit, but you've got to place this ember in the opponent's reach in order to use it. Just like captured ember, exalted ember is acquired by the opponent when your creature is destroyed. Their twist on this, however, was the ability to exploit this ember, making it far less of a risk and more of just another benefit. Exalting became a reward-reward mechanic much of the time, when the Saurians used it. Senator Shrix could use the ember on her to forge keys, Calipigian Ideal lets you choose which friendly creature you wanted to spend ember from, while Senator Brachus could use all the ember on your entire battle line for that purpose. Imperial Forge was a key cheat based on how much ember was on your creatures. Imperial Scutum and Praefectus Ludo moved ember on your creatures to the common supply instead of to your opponent when they were destroyed. Odoac the Patrician kept your ember from being stolen, Rudder Golem increased key cost, Tribune Pompatus and Primus Unguis exponentially boosted the power of your battle line, and Order Her Sorrow and the Golden Spiral allowed for house cheating. They even had insane combos like Tribute Six Semper and Cincinnatus Rex Golden Spiral. They had archiving, direct damage, board wipes, key cheats, huge creatures, an abundance of capturing, ways to move Ember around the board, house cheating, and utilize the new ward token to its fullest, allowing you to ward numerous of these high priority creatures at once. Their biggest weakness were cards that bounce creatures back to hand or purge them, bypassing those pesky destroyed effects. Needless to say, they were an absolute powerhouse. We had seen glimpses of this sort of potential in past sets, with cards like Mother Northell and Cell in Defense, but nothing at this level. Fantasy Flight clearly recognized this and toned them down quite a bit for Mass Mutation, and many say that this set's iteration of Saurian is actually its most balanced. The reward-reward aspect of Exalting finally became the risk-reward mechanism it was meant to be. Cards like Praefectus Ludo still existed, remaining a major threat and giving Saurian a place to dump its ember when creatures were inevitably destroyed, but was no longer also backed up by Imperial Scutum. They also retained their classic board wipe, Axiom of Grisk, and their ability to ward, with reprints like Ancient Power and new cards like Defense Initiative. Saurian also had to find a way to mesh with the overarching theme of this set, that of Mutation, but ultimately they're the house that was probably least affected by the mutations of Dark Ember. Outside of the Saurus-type creatures, Saurian only had four mutants, with Citizen Shrix being one of the best. Cards like Crystal Surge interacted with mutants, but that's about it really. And honestly, reading the flavor text on Crystal Surge, it's not hard to see why the Saurians had so little to do with mutation, as opposed to a house like Untamed or Logos. So, Mass Mutation Saurian was one of the, let's say, fairer iterations of the house. They still had some great cards with Faust the Great, Spoils of Battle, Dreadbone Decimus, and Amphora Captura as just a few examples, and they even received a gigantic creature in the form of Dusilus. Cards like Curiosaurus made moving Ember around the board much more interesting, and a lot safer for the one who knew how to properly use it. A number of creatures received cool monuments, Imperial Scutum and Calipigian Ideal were replaced with Siren Horn, and overall, Mass Mutation Saurian was often a lot of fun to play, though again, they were massively scaled back from Worlds Collide. Dark Tidings is where things started to go downhill fast. Many times I've referred to Saurian in this set as the Worlds Collide Brobnar of Dark Tidings. As always, they did a lot of capturing and exalting, but with critical cards like Praefectus Ludo failing to be reprinted, there was nowhere to put it. Only two cards put Ember from your creatures back into the common supply, the Uncommon Humble and the Rare Brachioditis. Gone were the days of Ludo and Scutum and even Curiosaurus. The Ember on friendly creatures was always at risk, with very little you could do about it. Even outside of dumping Ember, Saurian really just lacked decent tools to be a viable house in Dark Tidings. Axiom of Grisk, another classic card, was deleted from the set and replaced with Crushing Charge. Medicus Lacus attempted to be the new Senator Brachus, but all the opponent had to do to render him completely useless was to take the tide. Their artifact game was some of the worst I've ever seen in Keyforge, with positively horrendous cards like Serarium, ISS Indominus, and Trojan Sauropod being introduced. 
They did have a few decent cards, such as Decadence, Magister Vita, Dino You Didn't, and Carpe Venum. Faust and City State Interest were reprinted. Altruist Rostrum was introduced as well, as was Ostracize and Reach Advantage. But with practically no ways outside of Faust and Barry Riches to exploit Exalted and Captured Ember, a really weak artifact game, and lots of just really vanilla cards, Dark Tiding Saurian really struggled most of the time. A far fall from the times of Worlds Clyde, I must say. This is why I suggest that Saurian tells a perfect story of overcorrection. In Worlds Collide, they were a dynamic and formidable house with untouchable combos and lines of play that bordered on unfair, and I'd say are to this day still one of the top houses in the entire game. Mass Mutation balanced things out quite a bit, scaling back heavily on ways to exploit vulnerable Ember and making lines of play a little more interesting and combo oriented. Dark Tidings just did away with nearly everything that made Saurian workable. Goodbye Ember Dump, goodbye Warding, goodbye Ember Exploitation, goodbye Fun. But now, Winds of Exchange is nearly here, and this may be their chance to redeem themselves. Let's take a look at how Soaring performs in this new set based on the card pool and what we've seen so far from Keyforge Celebration. Let me just start with this. Saurian really seems to rely on a few key commons, without which your Saurian house may struggle a bit. One of these is Epic Poem, reading Play, Exalt a Friendly Creature, Gain one Ember for each Ember on that creature. This is more along the lines of classic Saurian exploiting Exalted Ember for massive gains, and in multiples, this can result in Ember Burst that's hard for the opponent to recover from. Another one of these cards is Legionary Trainer, who allows each of your token creatures to enter play ready. It's always a massive advantage when any of your cards have the ability to enter play ready and usable right out of the gate, and if your deck can generate lots of token creatures, Legionary Trainer is a must kill for the opponent. And just like cards such as Duskwitch, Legionary Trainer is a common, so you've gotta have an answer ready when he appears. So, Epic Poem and Legionary Trainer are a couple of very important cards in the Saurian card pool for this set. City State Interest, Faust the Great, Phalanx Strike, and Order Hisaro are all reprinted, all cards that really help make Saurian hum. In terms of enhancements, the mighty Amphora Captura is back for Mass Mutation, a fantastic artifact that exponentially increases the versatility of the deck it's in. The new enhancement provider is Grammaticus Thrax, putting two captures and a damage somewhere in your deck. A more important question for Saurian, however, is how well can it exploit Exalted Ember? Can it dump it into the common supply? Well, we've already mentioned Epic Poem, and cards like Ideal Tulia and Inspiring Oration benefit you with potentially numerous token creatures based on how much Ember is on your creatures. Ballastego, Symposium, and Recruit are all cards that also benefit off of Exalted Ember. Senator Brachus was reprinted, allowing you to spend Ember on friendly creatures as if it was in your pool. Chancellor Dexterous allows for some house cheating, kinda acting as the new Magic Trevita. Tribune Pompatus returns as well to boost some power. But once again, just like in Dark Tidings, Saurian was given practically zero methods of returning vulnerable Ember to the common supply. Ludo and Imperial Scutum are still nowhere to be seen. Even Humble and Curious Taurus were not reprinted. Exile was left behind as well. Ambrosia Outpost is about as good as it gets, essentially the new library of Polyosaurus. Captured and Exalted Ember is always in the opponent's reach, and I'd say that's one of the major flaws Saurian has in Winds of Exchange, especially because there is a lot of exalting and capturing throughout this set. Unfortunately, all that Ember goes virtually unprotected. Even the mechanic of Warding is very little seen in this set. Paraguardian is reprinted, and new Warding cards in Saurian include Pax Soriana and Arm the Plebeians. Cultist and Unfathomable wards as well, while White Aeronaut and Mars exclusively wards the Nautilixian. So the point is, Saurian can tend to make lots of Ember for the opponent to grab later on, and that can be quite risky, sometimes a little too risky. Like I said before, that's sort of the point of the Exalt mechanic, is that risk-reward aspect, but in Winds of Exchange, for most Saurian cards, it can tend to lean too far into the risk and not far enough into the reward, except for cards like Epic Poem, whose effect is probably almost always worth the Exalt. If there was just a little more protection for that Ember, it wouldn't be all that bad, but the Dark Tiding Saurian disease leaked into Winds of Exchange a little, with a distinct lack of Ember Dump. What about token creatures? Do the Saurians excel in that area? Honestly, their token creatures aren't that bad, with the exception of Trooper. Trooper was one of the cards that showed up in my video about woe cards I'm not looking forward to, because it exalts itself every time it fights or reaps. It's 5 power, making it a pretty big body, but that sort of excessive exalting is just not worth it to me, especially with the current Saurian climate we just discussed. The other Saurian tokens are pretty solid, however. Scholar adds some of that Logos efficiency to the house, while Senator has an action that increases key cost by 1, a classic Saurian effect. With lots of Senators on the board, combined with the Faust, key cost can skyrocket for the opponent. The last Saurian token is the Bellatoran Warrior, whose massive size of 5 power 2 armor is balanced by the linked card training costs, which can't be discarded outside of card abilities and forces you to lose 2 ember when you play it, like you're literally paying for the Warriors to be in your deck. 
At first, this payment sounds terrible, but in practice, it's actually totally worth it. Having even just four or five of these giant creatures on the board at a time poses a massive threat for the opponent, and one that's not easy to get rid of. And training cost itself could be made into one of these token creatures, or discarded from your hand through an ability like the old Tinkers, so it's only in very unfortunate circumstances that you may end up chaining yourself for much of the game. Sorian actually only has a few cards that make token creatures, but sometimes they can do so in quite large amounts, with cards such as Inspiring Oration and Conscription. Other token makers include Longsword Lector, Phalanx Leader, Recruit, and the aforementioned Legionary Trainer and Armed the Plebeians. Actually, one of Sorian's strongest traits in this set is board control and token counter. They do lots of direct damage and splash attack damage, utilizing actions and creatures such as Beware the Ides, Phalanx Strike, Chaosodon, and Imperator Drusilla. They have lots of board control that target token creatures as well. Crushing Charge is a card I really disliked in Dark Tidings, but is perfect here in Winds of Exchange. Legion's March and Pale into Insignificance are great examples of this as well. Even Sorarium, another card I despised in Dark Tidings, has potential to work wonders against token creatures in this set. Sorian doesn't make a ton of token creatures, but that's usually okay since they counter them pretty well, and the ones they do make are pretty big half the time. Cards like Phalanx Leader and Tribune Pompatus even work as well to make those smaller token creatures of yours bigger to avoid such targeted token removal. They also have one of the coolest, most unique board control cards I've ever seen, Tectonic Shift. It reads play. Divide each player's battle line in half as evenly as possible without changing the order of creatures. For each battle line, destroy each creature in one of the halves. I definitely cannot wait to see this card mutilate some boards in some possibly crucial moments of the game in the future. Ember Control is important as well, and like I said earlier, great cards like City State Interest and Faust are back and better than ever. City State and Pax Soriana is almost the new City State Ancient Power combo, though Pax Soriana, even with its enticing two Ember Pips, requires much more proper timing to play well. The classic City Gates makes its reappearance, and Aquilia Lone Hero is awesome for its Omni ability allowing it to capture every turn. So overall, what is Sorian like in Winds of Exchange? Well, Sorian's identity has shifted a little over the sets, from a house that utilizes Ember on the board to a frustratingly powerful degree, to a house that rather likes to control the board, keeping the opponent from using theirs. Sadly, what they were able to consistently exploit in past sets, that have captured an exalted Ember, is now their greatest flaw in this set because that protection and exploitation is relatively sparse. It still exists and can be used to great degree, but not nearly as consistently. The very ember that Sorian puts on the board, they themselves struggle to reclaim once the opponent inevitably gets their hands on it. Sorian is extremely board-oriented in WoW, expertly employing tactics to destroy lower power creatures while boosting their own low power creatures to keep them out of firing range. They still have some moves, and I'm confident that there will be plenty of decks out there with really strong Sorian pods when WoW is released, but unfortunately, as of right now, I've got to say that Sorian is one of the weaker houses in this set. In many cases, Brobnar does what Sorian wants to do, but better, with greater rewards, less risk, and more pain for the opponent. But that's just the analysis I've made, and when the set is officially released, I would love to be proven wrong. Again, Sorian still has some great cards, and when it all comes together, they can burst like crazy and do some really impressive things. The house is still fully usable, but is overly risky a lot of the time. Risk-reward is a difficult mechanic to balance, and the history of how Sorian proves that. From Worlds Collide to the present, the tale of the Sorians has been one of overcorrection, and I'm excited to see how Winds of Exchange potentially works to perfect them. And there we have it! Let me know what you guys think of how Sorian and Winds of Exchange, how you think they'll function, and which iteration of them you like the best. I've so far only had a taste of them in this set, and I'm super excited to see how they truly play in the near future. Thank you all so much for watching, and I can't wait to see you all again in the next one. See you later.